Javi Turrisueño, bienvenido al equipo. Te va a encantar a trabajar aquí con nosotros. Gracias, licenciado. Nuestro CEO tiene una idea que va a revolucionar la industria del turismo para siempre. ¿Estás listo para escucharla? Ahí te va. Empacamos tu maleta. ¿Ah? Sí, sí, sí. Cuando vas a salir de viaje, mandamos una persona a tu casa para que empaque tus cosas por ti. A nadie le gusta empacar. Y además siempre se te olvida algo. Pero con nuestro servicio, eso será cosa del pasado. Se llama Maletia. Eh, ¿Qué versión de Java están usando? Excelente pregunta. Todos nuestros sistemas corren en Java 7. Y Struts 1. ¿Pero por qué esa cara? El 7 es el número de buena suerte. ¿Y el 1? Uno no es ninguno. Eh, ¿Sabe qué, licenciado? Me acabo de acordar que dejé prendida la estufa. Me tengo que ir. Hasta luego y gracias por todo. Él se lo pierde. Nobody wants drama in their tech stack. Java 21 and GraalVM both have new exciting releases coming out today, September 19th, 2023. So we're going to look at some of the latest and greatest features since Java 17 that culminate in today's drama-free and amazing new release. Let's dive right into it. Going to create a new project, Java 21. I'll add the GraalVM native image support. We're going to use Spring Boot 3.2 milestone. Hit generate. And then we need to update our build to use Java 21. We'll do that right now. Now, of course, uh, I'm using Java 17 as specified right now, but we're going to upgrade to Java 21. This isn't yet supported uh, particularly well with Gradle and all that stuff, uh, but that will come obviously in very short order. So for now, we'll just sort of force our hand here. Okay, so we've got this uh, Java source compatibility in the repositories. We're going to paste that, replace it with our snapshot milestone repositories, upgrade the GraalVM native image uh, distribution, uh, and then use Java 21 for the source and for the Java language tool chain. All right, we're going to make that change. Command shift I. Gradle itself isn't actually com compatible with Java 21 yet either, at least it so complains, but we don't care. It'll work just fine for us for now. All right, so we're going to build our application. Let's just take a look at some of the features that are in Java 21. And we'll do that by just writing some tests, okay? Let's look at some of the amazing new features that are in Java 17. We'll create a class. Did you know that there are multi-line strings now in Java, right? I, I just love this. This is not a new-ish thing, but it's a very nice thing. So var shake spear equals, right? Like that, and then paste that in there, voila. We'll get rid of all this. And we'll indent that all consistently. Okay, so I've got some Shakespeare in there, and that's just very convenient. Now, obviously, this is not entirely practical. You're not going to use Shakespeare in your code all that often. But imagine a SQL statement or a JSON uh, or whatever. I mean, there's all sorts of things you could be doing that require multi-line strings. They're very convenient. So we'll just prove that everything is working as we expect by looking at the first character in this multi-line string, right? So car at zero. And, uh, you know, if we if we leave things as are, as they are right now, the first character will be uh, T, but I'm going to add an indent. Um, and we'll expect that that should be T and it'll fail, right? So it's actually going to be not equals, okay? Not equals. And then if we redefine Shakespeare to be Shakespeare and then strip leading, then this should be equals, okay? Equals. Very good. So we've got two different um, very simple examples here. Let's go ahead and run this and see what that buys us. 
All right, everything is working as we expected. So multi-line strings are a nice feature in Java 17 and later. Another feature that I love are records. We'll go here, we'll create a new class called record test. And here, we're gonna have a little test. Void records to kind of see what they are, okay? Records, the promise of records is that uh, for certain kinds of uh, types, uh, where you just want immutability and you want a carrier for components whose uh, identity is equal to the identity of the object in which they're contained, uh, like for example, records being transmitted over the wire, date, DTOs, uh, you know, simple things like that. It, you could create a class and create a two string and an equals and a constructor and hash code and all that. But again, if it's just a dumb carrier for data, like a, like a network ready struct, then records are just a really great choice. So we're gonna create a record here to, rec to represent, let's say an event, okay? JDK released event. Okay, and uh, we'll have a uh, string name, okay? And that's it, I can, obviously I can create my own constructors here if I want to, I can create a secondary uh, or canonical constructor like this, but it, but again, if I just leave it as is, this is a class, it's a Java Lang class, it's a Java object that has a constructor parameter called name, which is already assigned storage and given a immutable uh, accessor. So let's try that, okay, var new JDK released event, uh, Java 21. Okay, there we go. So there's our new event. Now, what you know, what can we do with that? Well, let's um, let's unpack it. We can uh, we can see that uh, the event has a name, and we can assert that is Java 21. That'll be true, right? And if we just print out the uh, information, if we just print out the object itself, we get some interesting behavior there as well. Okay, so let's just run this and see what we get here. Okay, there we go. So we created the object. We got a nice two string. We got a name equals Java 21. We don't get some reference to its memory contents or anything like that, as you would with a default two string. Uh, we had this nice accessor, all that stuff you get for free with records in Java 21 and actually Java 17 as well. Another huge feature in uh, Java 17 was the enhanced switch statement. So we'll create a new class, enhanced switch test, okay. And this is just gonna be a, let's suppose that we have a um, method to calculate time off given a day of the week, okay? This is an enum, right? So day of the week is an enum. And let's suppose I wanna go through that and I just say time off equals zero. This is the regular switch, okay? I'm gonna do time off equals zero, switch uh, day of week, and I can then iterate over the different values in the enum. I can say, okay, well, from Monday, Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the time off equals, you know, um, 16, right? That's 24 minus eight, let's, uh, let's say. And of course I need to break, okay? I need to break, otherwise it'll fall through, which is not what we want. And then we want Saturday, and then Sunday, and for those, time off equals 24. So you get the whole day off, great, fantastic, okay? So now I've got a, a result, and then I can return the time off, and that's how much time you get depending on the day of week, okay? So now, let's see what that gives us. So test, void, whatever, day off, okay? Throws exception, or not, we well, actually probably doesn't in this case. Time off, okay, good. Now, what are we gonna do? We're gonna say um, var, time off equals, calculate day of week, day of week Friday, and we want that to be, uh, you know, we can actually just get rid of that, assertions dot equals this, uh, and this one which should be, it should be 16, right? And then uh, what about on Monday, or actually on, on the weekend, Saturday, right? So calculate time off, day of week, Saturday, and then that should be 24, okay? Let's just confirm that's true. Run that again. Okay, we go down and you can see the test is true. So that worked, that's a, a classic traditional um, switch statement, but it's very verbose and there's lots of errors. And if I forget to add a break, then it'll automatically drop down to the next case and we might get other side effects and all that. So what we want is to simplify this code if we can, and that's where the enhanced switch statement uh, comes in, right? So we're gonna use this int, Get rid of that, day of week, 
And here we can just return the results of the switch are an expression now. So I can say return switch day of week. Okay. And here, case, you know, we can just take all this. Right? Much better. Use the lambda sort of uh, arrow expression. And then the value is 16. There's no drop through. But of course, also, since we're using an enum, notice that the enum here, see that? We don't, it, it's, it's telling us we didn't cover all possible cases. Here, it doesn't do that. It doesn't know that we've exhausted all the possible cases. So it's not like we're gonna add another day to the week sometime soon, but imagine some other enum where, you know, you've added a new thing to the enum. Now you've got this case that you're not handling in your switch statement. If you're using the enhanced switch statement, that, that'll get taken care of for you. So uh, Saturday and then Sunday, and we want that to be 24, right? There we go. That's much better. So now we use that, run the tests again, right? Same same exact result we should expect. Very good, very clean, much easier to understand, much easier to read. And now we don't have these uh, annoying intermediate variables and you know, there's no way to like accidentally set this to something else. There's no fall throughs and you get exhaustiveness checks, okay? So this is all stuff that you need to know about in Java 17, which I think are pretty nice in of themselves, but they really are just sort of important milestones on the journey uh, in, important landmarks on the journey to Java 21, where we finally get to a destination that is, I think you're gonna find very, very nice. Another thing that's part of Java 17, but that doesn't really buy you a lot just yet, is sealed types. So we'll, let's go ahead and demonstrate those. Let's say we have a class here called animal. Animal. And we want to have two subclasses, right? So cat, extends animal and cat dog extends animal and we now want to talk to them well of course cats meow dogs bark and these are different things so let's have a method to extract out, you know, the, whatever they're trying to say to us, right? Communication. So communicate, and we'll pass in an animal, and we'll do some tests here. We'll say, okay, well, the var message equals, it's a string, of course, but we don't know what it's gonna be yet. So we'll say, okay, if the, we have an, if, we, if the animal instance of dog, then we cast it, dog animal, and we get the uh, message equals dog dot bark, okay? Um, if animal instance of cat, then we can say var cat equals cat animal, and message equals cat dot meow, okay? And there's our, our the message that they're trying to communicate to us. There's the communication. Now we can go here, create a simple method, uh, you know, uh, do little test, okay? Uh, and we create an object, so var dog equals new dog. Now we can actually just call it an animal, and we pass that in, so communicate animal, great. So what do we expect that to be? We expect this to be um, wolf, right? Does that seem fair? And then, you know, actually, let's just try this again. We'll put that down here, keep that over there. And then what about a new cat? Well, new cat, meow, very good. Okay, so let's run this little test. Okay, great, so that worked, right? Um, but the problem is, what happens if we come along and we add another animal, right? Another uh, thing, right? So string chirp. Turn chirp, okay? Well now, we've added this new type, but we haven't tested that here, right? Uh, and so we need to make sure that when we change the hierarchy, when we add a new thing to the hierarchy, that the compiler tells us so that we can know to go through and clean up the code, okay? One thing we might do is to make these sealed. So I can say extends at class animal, uh, a sealed class, extends animal, permits cat and dog. So we're, we're telling the runtime that 
only these two classes are allowed to extend it, right? Uh, and uh, these two either have to be sealed and permit other subclasses, or they have to be final, okay? So the compiler is now looking out for us. And when we try and do this, when we try and extend animal for the bird, you can see it's, it's, not allowed, it's not allowed to do that, right? Animal is part of the sealed hierarchy. Birds can't extend that. And also, we know that that's a problem, and now we, we, we can look at the code and um, go through and make sure we add a new case for that, right? So if we want to make that change, and I think we should, then bird, okay, uh, go back here. This has to be final, great. And now we can go here, and if animal instance of bird, var bird equals bird animal, okay? And then message equals bird dot chirp. Very good, okay? So now we've cleaned this code up a bit. Uh, we've got this new sealed types thing, but basically, you know, what we're getting here is um, kind of like a, a more nuanced final, right? Otherwise, there's no other real way to limit uh, who can extend what in the JDK save for visibility and final, right? Uh, sealed gives you a more granular approach, allows you to have a self-contained hermetic sort of hierarchy of objects. Remember that enhanced switch that we just looked at? Well, you can actually use that here as well. So instead of doing what we were just doing, let's rewrite this to use the enhanced switch, okay? So communicate animal, okay? And uh, we're gonna use this as a classic communicate. We won't use that. We'll say return switch animal. And now we can use patterns to actually extract out the type of object. And so we can say cat, cat, if so, cat dot meow, right? Uh, do the same thing for the dog, dog. And that's this right here, dog. And uh, this is no longer meow, of course, bark. There we are. Now, of course, one of the nice things about this is because the type hierarchy is sealed, we get this really nice interaction where the switch statement knows we haven't enumerated all the possible values, just like it does for the enums, right? Enums have a finite possible set of, of values. Same thing here for sealed types. So now the compiler is telling us we haven't covered all possible values. If we weren't using uh, the sealed types, then we could have a default, you know, and just say, you know, Hello, I don't know, whatever, something like that. Um, but I would rather just handle all the types as they come. And so here I can just add the bird, bird. And we say bird dot chirp, voila. So that's a much cleaner version. And um, we need, oh, we still have a default because of course, class animal. I wonder if I make this an interface, right? Right, and we implement that. There we go. There you go. So, so you see, now that's much cleaner. It knows that the interface doesn't have an implementation uh, and the other ones do, okay? So this is much cleaner. So let's go ahead and check that that works as we expect. Nice. All right, so we can see these things kind of are starting to, they're layering on top of each other. We've got uh, sealed types, we've got the enhanced switch expression, we've got this new instance of and the sort of pattern matching that's implied in that. And this is where we start to butt into the border of Java 21 and the new features since Java 17. The pattern matching and the enhanced switch expression uh, and records all play together really nicely as well. Let's take a look at, ex at that. Okay, so we've got a new records test. Let's suppose that we have a bunch of events. Remember, we talked about events before. Let's say that we have a, a user that has a name and a account number. And we have an, another event, user deleted event, okay? Passing in the user. We have another event called user created event. This is the, the command instruct, this is the command instructing us to create something new. And now we want to actually respond to the event. So we say respond to the event, and the event is an object of some sort. We don't know which kind. Um, and here, we're going to say return switch o case. And of course, you saw what we did earlier. We could say user deleted event. You know, user deleted event. Then we do something. We can provide a response to that, right? And then same thing for the uh, user created event user created event, etc. Okay, so that will work. But it's, you know, I would rather since it, since it is a, um, a an, an event. And since it is a record, 
Um, actually, we can just do a, a null for that. Since it is an event and it's a record, we can actually extract out, rather than having to have this uh, uh, intermediate variables, we can extract out the individual parts of the record in this the expression here, okay? So let's say that we want the uh, user, user, right? And if you don't want to be redundant about the type, you can actually do var, and now I can say the user, uh, you know, dot name has been deleted, okay? Well, what about this one? Okay, well here, here I'm gonna extract out the name as well. So I'll say uh, var name, get rid of that. The new user with name, name has been created. Huh? Not bad. So now let's try this out. Let's create a little test here. Void respond to events, throws exception. And here I'm gonna say, okay, var response, actually assertion equals um, respond new user created event, uh, jlong, and uh, the, the value that we're expected to get here is this. Okay, there's that. And then what about the other one? Well, what if we do a deletion? And here, Okay, let's run that and see what we get. Nice, huh? These things are just layered on top of each other. I just love pattern matching. I love the record support. I love sealed types. And it all just really comes together nicely uh, to mean that the compiler is now on your side for so many things where before it would just kind of leave you to your own direction. All these things started to take root in earlier versions of Java, but they culminate here in Java 21, in what you might call data-oriented programming. This is not, of course, a replacement for object-oriented programming, but a complement to it. You can use things like pattern matching, the enhanced switch, and the instance of operator uh, to give your code a new kind of polymorphism without having to expose a dispatch point in your public API. I love Java 21. There's, of course, a lot of other amazing things here, uh, most of them are small, but they're very nice. And of course, there's Project Loom and Virtual Threads. Virtual Threads alone are worth the price of admission. But let's dive into some of those uh, smaller, amazing features first. In the, world, in the world of AI and algorithms, mathematics are more important than ever. So let's see some of the new amazing support uh, in Java 21 for new kinds of uh, operations. So test. Uh, and we're going to create a uh, multiplication example here using the new uh, support in the big integer class. So we're going to have a start value of big integer dot value of 10. And we'll have a result equals start dot parallel multiply big integer, you know, 2. Okay. And we want to say that uh, we think that'll be 20. Now, these are obviously very, very low numbers, but uh, you can kind of get the idea, right? So it should be 10 times 2, uh, 20, right? Or sorry, the um, result is that. So it would be big integer of that, okay? Let's run that. And the reason this is nice is because it's doing the multiplication in parallel. This may or may not be an efficient gain for you. In our case, um, it's not, right? Uh, the, the value has to be in the thousands of bits for this to be uh, of relevance to you, but, uh, but it's just very nice. It can be very, very efficient for very large values. Okay, another thing that's really nice in the new, uh, in, you know, in the math world uh, is the new division methods. Okay, so throw an exception. And we're gonna say 
math.divide exact 10 divided by 2. Okay, and then we'll see that it is equal to that, right? And uh, let's run all that test. Oops, wrong, ran the wrong one. So what we get is a new method here that'll do division for you. This is very nice because it also accounts for things like uh, overflow values as well as divide by zero errors and so on. It's just very convenient. Um, I don't know if that uh, most people are gonna run into a use case where they need it, but it's just nice to know it's there. If you're doing asynchronous programming, and yes, of course, that's still a thing, even with Project Loom, uh, then you know, you're gonna be pleased to know that our old friend, the future, uh, has gotten a slight upgrade. So let's take a look at that here. Future test throws exception. First things first, we're gonna use the auto closable executor. I love this. Executors dot, okay, whatever, or better yet, runtime dot get rid. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so we've got our new executor, our new thread pool, basically. Um, and we're gonna submit a thread and get a Java future back, okay? So executor dot submit system out hello world, okay? Now that's gonna give us a response and we can do some interesting things after we wait, assume, you know, assured that it's actually finished its work. We can now uh, switch over it. So var result equals switch over future dot state, okay? And uh, that state is a new thing in Java 21 or Java 19 that gives us uh, an enum of the state of the application, of the state of the thread. So it can say case canceled or uh, failed. Then we can say throw new illegal argument exception uh, or new legal state exception, I suppose. Legal state exception. Couldn't finish the work. Okay. Otherwise, success. We say future dot result now. Otherwise, default is we just do nothing. There's nothing happening yet, so there's no result, okay? So we can now easily sort of inspect the state uh, to kind of easily understand what's happening with the, the work that we've done. So obviously, in our case, we're just printing things out. So let's just go ahead and do assert equals uh, result, hello world. And uh, the thing that we did, it was actually a printout. Let's just return it. There you go. There's that and that. We've got to add an exclamation mark. So now let's run this test. Okay, so that worked as we expected. Great. One place where you might want to wrap an asynchronous operation in a future, or indeed also to use Project Loom, is with the HTTP client that's been in Java since Java 20, no, that's been in Java since Java 11. So let's do that. So HTTP throws exception. What's nice here is that the HTTP client is also auto-closable in Java 21. So try var HTTP, HTTP client dot new client, and then we say var request equals HTTP request dot new builder, URI dot create, HTTPS dot www dot adobe dot com dot get dot build var response equals HTTP send request And now what kind of response do we want? Well, I'll just take a string, okay? And with the response, I wanna assert that the response status code is equal to 200. And we can also print out the response if we want. So response.body is a string. So now let's run this. All right, good. There's the HTML from that website. The status code is 200. It's great. It's a small but convenient little thing. I like this a lot. One thing to be aware of is you want to make sure that you don't use the auto-closable API in conjunction with a future. Because if you launch a thread before you've finished using the HTTP client and that thread runs in a, in a different thread of execution, then the client will get closed before you get a chance to do anything useful with it. Using the HTTP client, we ask for a string back. Now, strings are great because you can do all sorts of things with them, uh, including uh, test for the presence of emojis. So. That's another new feature in Java 21. At test 
void uh, emojis. All right, let's try it out. Here's the shocked face emoji. It's part of Unicode. And we want to print it out, obviously, just so we can see it. And uh, we can also, so we're going to print it out. Now let's get the, uh, the code point for it. So we'll say character.codepoint at shocked faced emoji to car array. We'll look at it relative to the zero offset. And then we want to assert it's true. Okay, let's try this. It worked. I'm not surprised. Are you surprised? Why do you look so surprised? Okay, great. So we've we've got uh, this nice ability to test for emojis. Perhaps more usefully for a lot of us is finally, 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 there's a way to repeat strings. So and that's a uh, uh, using the new using the string builder. There's a new method called repeat that you can add like let's say ten times and then two string. So now let's test that they're equal. I've got a 10 line string there. Let's make sure that that lines up with that. We'll run this again. Okay, looks like it's it's equal. So this is so convenient. I mean, it's just a small thing, but it's just a quality of life thing. Can we finally please get rid of all the string util classes now? Is there something that is still as yet not there? There's ways to reverse strings, to do uh, repeats, to do all sorts of interesting things. You might want to do strings. They're either in the strings class or in supporting sort of a, a, a satellite classes like this one. If I wanted to store those things in a collection and maintain some sort of order, I could use some of the existing types uh, in the JDK, uh, including list and linked hash set. But the problem is that these things have no common ancestor. Well, no longer. Now they do. That now they can be used uh, with a common base type. We're going to create a list here, okay? New array list of string. And it in turn extends abstract list and implements list, which now extends sequenced collection. That's part of Java 21. So you can ask for things to be reversed. You can add things to the very beginning of the collection, to the end of the collection. You can remove the first and the last items. You can get the first and last items, uh, etc. So we can say, if list instance of, I mean, this is a little redundant. We know this is true, but uh, lit sequence collection, then I want to say string, of course, then sequence collection dot uh, add first a, or actually I can just add a different uh, greetings here, I suppose. So um, ciao, add hola, add ni hao, add salu, hello, and hola. Okay, now I want to add, I want to add something else uh, to the beginning. So let's actually, let's say I go back here, I say add, and I want this to be first. Okay, great. So now if we do a test, true, you know, sequenced collection dot get first equals hola. And similarly, we can say list dot get zero assertions dot equals voila okay so it's very convenient let's go ahead and run this test very good okay so let's say i wanted to use a one of those aforementioned linked hash sets i can go here i can use a new constructor linked hash set for this and I'll, of course it's still going to be for type of string and actually if we look at this if we look at the linked hash set type this type now implements sequenced set, which in turn in implements sequence collection. So sequenced sets have a reverse method, okay? Um, okay, good, so now we have a linked uh, hash set, uh, you know, a, a sequenced collection. All the other stuff still works, except for this, obviously, because we can't do random, we can't do random access. Uh, but basically it's the same thing, right? The other thing that's nice about these constructors is that it does the math to make sure that we don't have to do any rehashing, right? So when you think about how a hash works, right, you have, or uh, items that are hashed and they are maintain their identity via that hash. Um, as you 
when you create a new collection of a type hash set, you allocate a certain number of slots of empty space. As soon as you've added more than you've allotted, behind the scenes, the, co the collection has to create a new uh, array behind the scenes, double the length, uh, and then rehash everything and move it over. So it's very expensive to exceed the number of allotted slots. This does the math for you. You can see it's actually doing hash map dot calculate hash map capacity, given that you want to have this number of uh, elements. Also remember that the number of elements uh, itself, you know, if you if you have a, a new collection and you allocate a certain number of elements, uh, it's also going to do a buffer. So it's not going to give you 100 slots. I, I, I forget what the, uh, I guess it's 75% looking at this load capacity here. Um, but either way, uh, there's a lot of math that goes on there. So it's just nice that that's all done for you in this new constructor. And there are other, other constructors around the, the, the platform of this variety. Very convenient. Now, finally, we can get to Loom. I've covered a, a lot of my favorite things, not everything by any stretch, but a lot of my favorite things in Java 21. But I imagine that you, as as well as I, are, are most excited about both pattern matching and Loom. You've heard a lot about Loom, and certainly we've talked a lot about it here in this channel and elsewhere on the internet. Uh, but the basic idea is to make that code that you wrote in college scalable, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, let's take an example here, okay? Create a new class called Loom Test. And we're going to create a, uh, it's, it's not a test method, public static void main string args. There was exception. And uh, here, we're going to write a very simple uh, network server. Okay, so var server socket equals new server socket 9090. Okay, and we're going to say try this. And uh, we're going to say while true. And we're going to say service socket dot accept. That'll give us a client socket, basically, or just a client, or just a socket. And we want to handle that client socket, right? We've got a new network server, and that client socket has access to the input stream, the output stream, all the information about the client, including their address, uh, etc. So I want to handle that request. So I'll create a new method here, static void handle request, right? And I'll give it a socket as a parameter, and we'll do something with and we'll do something with that socket in just a second. But the thing is, we're going to probably do some input and output. Well, this might take a long time, you know, for lots of reasons, right? The client might connect and send a lot of data. Uh, it might send it might send a little bit of data, but then like not send anything while not closing the connection. Whatever the reasons are, uh, we need to make sure that we are able to handle other requests at the same time. So we'll use an executor, right? Var executor equals executors dot new. Uh, fixed thread pool, new fixed thread pool. Okay, and the convention here has always been, uh, you know, just use as many as you've got processors for true absolute concurrency. Okay, so I'll say uh, executor dot submit handle request passing in the client socket. Okay, and we're just going to do try catch blah. Okay, there we go. So very very simple code. What are we going to do in here? Well, we're going to read the data, right? So we'll say var next equals negative one var BAOS equals new byte array output stream. I'm going to say that like this. And then we'll say try var in equals socket dot get input stream. And we'll say while next equals in dot read. And I'm going to do, I'm going to assign that all to a variable there. While it's not true, we're going to say BAOS dot write uh, next, right? And then uh, we're going to have the values here. Um, and then now we can say var input message equals uh, in equals BIOS to string, right? And we can just print that out. Request. Okay. Mm -hmm. Formatted input message. Great. So it's a main method. So we're going to go ahead and use the terminal here. And we'll say Gradle boot test run. That's up and running. And now we can say echo hello and then do netcat 127.0.0.1.9090. You can see there it says request hello. What about ni hao? Okay. Okay. So it's working. We have a basic network server. Before we go into Loom, let's just be clear about what just happened. I wrote a network service. The network service uh, had the risk of multiple clients using it at the same time. Great. So we use threads, but threads cost about two megabytes of RAM by default these days, right? Before Java 21. And so we pool them. Okay. But even there, we're very much, we're very much in a situation where if we have too many requests at the same time, we can exhaust the pool and therefore be unresponsive to traffic. And it, the worst 
part of it, the pity of it is that nothing is actually happening. When we're waiting for those next bytes, we're not using the CPU, nothing is being done, we're just wasting time, right? This computer costs a lot of money and yet it's unable to move forward and nothing's happening either. It's the worst of both worlds. We're, we're doing nothing and we can do nothing. Unfortunately, that thread has no choice but to sit there parked on a thread waiting for something to happen until now. Java 21 brings with it virtual threads. Now it's possible to create millions of threads for cheap. It's easy, but fundamentally the facts on the ground are that real threads are expensive. So how can the JDK let us have millions of threads? Simple. It has a greatly improved runtime that now notices when we're blocked and suspends execution of the thread on the thread until the thing we're waiting for is finished. Then it quietly puts us back on another thread. The real thread acts as carriers for what we call virtual threads, allowing us the illusion of millions of threads. Java 21 has improvements in all places that historically block threads, like blocking IO and input stream and output stream and thread.sleep. So now that they're correctly able to signal to the runtime that it's okay to reclaim the thread and repurpose it for other virtual threads, allowing work to progress even when a virtual thread is blocked, quote unquote. You can see that in this example here uh, that I'm gonna sh shamelessly steal from Jose Pomard, one of the Java developer advocates at Oracle, whose work I love, uh, we're going to launch a lot of threads to the point where we need to start sharing carrier threads and then put them in sleep, which would normally block, but not in virtual threads. So what we want to do is we want to see uh, the names of the threads change as we move from one thread to another. So new concurrent skip list set. Okay, so I'm going to create a concurrent uh, safe uh, set of strings, so it's going to be unique. And then we're going to launch a lot of threads. Okay, so thread dot uh, virtual unstarted. I'm going to pass in a runnable. Okay. Uh, and here's just one thread. What I want to do is I want to actually want to create a, uh, a lot of them, right? So I'll say int stream int stream dot range 0 to 100 map to object index and we'll create a new thread here we'll say thread that virtual and started okay so now we have a, a huge collection of threads and we're going to turn that all into a list okay and then we're going to visit them and start them up so four of our t threads t dot start four of our t threads t dot join. Now, uh, this is going to start the threads, but right now it's doing nothing. So let's make sure that it actually does something that requires it to take time. So we're going to note if this is the first one. So first equals, uh, if this is the first thread that gets thrown, we're going to sample just that one. Okay. So if the index is zero, then we're on the first thread. So uh, if first, we'll say observed dot add thread dot current thread dot whatever, just two string actually, it's more fun. Okay, good. And uh, then we'll sleep. So thread dot sleep, 100 milliseconds, add, a, add that. We'll copy and paste this, capture the current thread after the sleep, and then we'll sleep some more. So we'll say thread dot sleep 20, and then uh, we'll capture this if we're on the first one. And the point is that we created 100 threads, so there's contention here, right? So they have to interleave, they have to share, they carry a thread, this would be inefficient otherwise, right? Um, and then same thing, so, you know, let's do another thread.sleep, I suppose I could just copy and paste at this point, okay? Uh, and then finally, do another test. So we're sleeping, not even a whole second here in total for each thread, but we wanna make sure that others are not blocked and that the actual threads are able to move forward, okay? So let's run this, and then if we run this, we should see that uh, there's a lot of threads, right? The thread has actually, our virtual thread has been moved to different uh, carrier threads over time. So let's assert that the um, observed collection is greater than one, right? Let's just run this test now. Okay, and if we scroll down and we look at the output there, you can see there's virtual threads, right? Three of them at least. Virtual thread 32, 32, 32, fork join pool 
one, six, seven, et cetera. So it's actually switched from one place to another. It's the same virtual thread, but it's moved to an actual thread different times, okay? And it was transparent to us. We didn't have to rewrite our code. There's no reactive programming and callbacks. There's no async await like in other languages. It's just this very convenient uh, sort of style of programming. Uh, and this is the same thing that's happening with input streams and output streams. We do something that blocks, the runtime moves us out of the thread while it's waiting for the thing to happen. And as soon as the thing has happened, it moves us back onto a real thread uh, inside the virtual thread, and then we can do something, okay? But it's all transparent to us. So it requires almost no changes to our code, except that you saw here, I had to use thread.of virtual. This is a new constructor. There's also of platform, which is, you know, I'm not gonna use that. Um, if you're using an executor service, going back to our network service from earlier, well then you just do this, new, virtual thread task pool executor, right? New virtual thread per task executor. That's the only code, code change we have to make to get that to work. Nice, very, very nice. You might be wondering, well, I'm using Spring Boot. Spring Boot has lots of threading all over the place. Anywhere there's a, a task executor, you, you can uh, say that's a, a thread pool. So when you create web requests or web services, when you do integration, messaging, all this kind of stuff has thread pools. If you're using Spring Boot 3.2, coming out in November of 2023, and using Java 21, then you can just say virtual threads enabled equals true. And that'll automatically plug them in uh, for you. Very, very good. All right, my friends, we've done a good job. We've got all these different uh, things coming together. We're using uh, Spring Boot 3.2, we're using Java 21. And obviously all of this pairs very nicely with Gravium native images, which are also now supporting Java 21 as of today, as of the release of Java 21 today. So go out, download Java 21. Try the milestones for Spring Boot 3.2 and uh, let us know. We'd love to see uh, what, what your experience is. We hope this is uh, productive for you. Java 21 is an amazing, amazing, sing possibly the single most important release of Java. Um, this is the single most important, in my estimation, this is the single most important S uh, version of Java to be released uh, since maybe Java 8 or Java 5. Uh, it is an incredibly important thing. It offers us unparalleled scalability with some of the most succinct uh, syntax in the in the game. Uh, I think paralleled only by something like Go, right? Other languages have async await, which complicates things considerably. Uh, so I think we're in a really amazing place. So try out GraalVM, try out Project Loom, try out Java 21. There's never been a better time. Remember, there's never been a better time to be a Java developer.